Our next presenter is uh, Karen Bender, who has written such amazing books as Town of Empty Rooms, Refund, and Like Normal. She was a National Book Award finalist for Refund, and her stories have appeared pretty much anywhere you would want to go to read good stories. Um, one more, and this will be the last pol political comment of the night, or even quasi-political. But as I was coming over here, I got a call from somebody, and they asked where I was going, and I said I'm going to the five under 35 celebration. And there was a long, uncomfortable pause, and they said, why is 538 having a celebration? <laughs> so, please welcome Karen. this incredible program, and I am so relieved to be here where language is valued for beauty, for specificity, and clarity, and truth. I'm really happy about that. Um, I'm here to introduce Sue Lee's amazing book, Transoceanic Lights, um, and because one of the things that drew me to the book uh, was his sentences, I just want to read a little bit about So, and then I'll talk more about it. Um, uh, the paragraph um, is at the beginning where the child narrator is taking a plane with his family from mainland China, China to the U.S. I was there in the window seat next to them, entirely unaware of the turbulence of their thoughts. I lifted the shade to look down at the clouds passing at the pace of snails and thought to myself that I could walk faster. We were confined inside that aerial juggernaut for what felt like months, crammed amidst rows of seats between which attendants clad in orange-blue vests served compartmented meals from rectangular carts on yo-yo wheels. For several nights in a row before boarding that flight, I had lain in bed wondering what it would be like to fly, how my heart would seize as on the first slope of a roller coaster, how the wind would rush against my face, how the passengers would be flung about. Yet I did not imagine this, not so slow, not so still. Transoceanic Lights is a story of journeys across countries, through marriages, and most powerfully, through childhood. What drew me to this book was a sense of feeling that rose from Sue Lee's beautiful sentences palpably from the beginning, and in the ways he depicted with nuance the particular experience of three families immigrating from China to an unnamed city in the US. The child narrator takes us with precision and deep feeling into the experience of these characters. We see the families drawing cards to decide who will get the bedroom or living room in the apartment they all share. We see the way the fear of a bully and elementary school haunts the young narrator's imagination, how he's consumed with guilt when Mandy, a beloved classmate from school, is hit by a car and he, another, he and another boy are chasing her. Lee brings the narrator's world to life with exquisite and sometimes dreamlike specificity. I was moved by the honesty of this book by the ways in which Lee does not protect his characters, but gives them dignity by revealing them with all of their gorgeous human flaws and vulnerabilities. One of the most memorable moments in this book for me was when the mother leaves a narrator who's six years old and his two and a half month old sister, May, alone at home, when she goes to work at a seafood restaurant because it was too expensive to hire a babysitter. The mother calls several times an hour to check on them, and the father argues passionately about this decision. It's a stunning moment that, in its precise and unsentimental depiction of this family's struggles, creates a deep empathy for them. This is a brave book in its faith in the power of messiness, of complexity. It's a necessary and moving addition to the literature of immigration which is especially important now. And through the specific lens of the experience of these Chinese immigrants, this unnamed narrator, 
Transoceanic Lights beautifully depicts the path we all take, the road from the nation of childhood. So um, I'm going to read a page from chapter two. Um, so the five-year-old narrator is uh, sitting in class on the first day of school. And he's mortified because he's got to use the bathroom, but he's too scared to ask for permission. So instead, he sits there and he just daydreams. And I picked this scene, uh, particularly because it's a fond personal memory. <laughs> and also because I think that the awkward scenario of having to really take a piss, but not really knowing how, is a perfect metaphor for the immigrant experience. <laughs> The sensation in my lower abdomen grew to that of a bloated pain and felt on the verge of bursting. The clock hands lapped nauseating circles as they had done all day, taking their eternal time. Maybe it would pool on the seat, overflow onto the floor, and darken the fabric over my crotch, like the residue of those flowers in my lap. I did not know their names, Having fallen overripe with thick, velvety petals, they occupied in my memory a throne of permanence. I remembered the wooden seat my father constructed after hours of sawing and hammering and drilling in the space beneath our balcony where, on a certain New Year's Day, a million paper ballerinas once heaped. The seat was attached to his bicycle, and when he rode toward her river, I held on over his steering hands and directed him over manholes so I could listen to the echo of their metallic clatter as he pedaled past the shadows of strangers, invisible chirping crickets, empty benches, overflowing garbage cans, and the glow of white bulbs hanging like faux moons from poles to drench the pavement in silver puddles. He would remind me of those evening excursions 16 years later when my mother divorced him. When I outgrew the seat the following year, he dissembled it and made a new one, which he fastened to the rear of the bicycle during my third summer, when the trees were in bloom, when my mother learned a new recipe for a medicinal broth of assorted herbs, mango pits, and those nameless red-purple flowers. I remembered sitting in the living room on a short stool, the mangoes slick and slippery after my mother peeled off the yellow skin spotted with moles, and greedily burying my teeth into the sweet golden flesh. The honey-thick syrup trailing down the sides of my mouth, fingers and arms, luscious drops that hung for a moment from my chin and elbows before staining the newspapers spread on the floor. The large oblong seeds were collected and pierced and tied with string to coat hangers hung on the balcony to dry. My father and I went to gather the red-purple flowers at the park. Those fallen we picked up, the unfallen he knocked down with a stone tied to the end of a rope, which he twirled above his head, aimed, and released. He put me on his shoulders, and I swore my wrist like he had taught. It made whooshing sounds, but felt fruitless each time. Next time, he said, when you're older, you'll get it, he said. And after accumulating a bounty deemed sufficient, he pedaled back to the house while I sat in the back, my arms around his waist, a heap of dying flowers covered in soot and embalmed in their own juices, uncomfortably stacked on my lap, staining my crotch with the color of bruised blood that evaporated to turn blue and black for my mother to scrub off in a tub with brush and soap. How embarrassing it would be if I were to wet myself in this room full of strangers.